my boys were freshmen in high school, I talked to them about what kind of groups they had, what, what, what members, what, where, were, where did they fit into the social pecking order. We had only two, it was the socias and the hoods. Uh, they have a very complex pecking order, five or six groups, and sometimes with somewhat permeable barriers, somewhat fluid barriers, and yet there's still very much a pecking order. Could you sit with the cheerleaders at your high school? Could you sit with the jocks at your middle school? And if you did, what would happen? Unless you were a cheerleader or a jock, what if one of the jocks decided to sit with one of the science nerds? Would there be a pecking order then as well? What if you decided to sit with a group that was outside of your department, if you're in work? What about being invited to a party? Those that are in high school are probably keenly aware of this. Who's on the list and who's not? And how hurtful it is when you're not. There's a clear social delineation, isn't there, in our world, in our schools, in our bands, in our sports teams, among the techies, and even in church. The seats of honor and, well, if not shame for the uncool, are even there on the bus. We see it all around us. Some of us are probably reliving our applause of shame moments right now as I'm discussing it. Truth be told, it doesn't just happen at school, does it? It happens in the workplace and in book clubs, present when we're in volunteering groups, even at church. It happens everywhere, but perhaps a little less obviously than it does in middle school or high school. And given that most of our kids are returning to school this week or already have returned to school, I would imagine that some of us have already reconnected to some of those feelings. In Hebrews 9, which is our series that we've been in, the la this is the last of our series, we've been going through a, a theme called Together We. We've uh, lifted up a line today, which I think is just beautiful. Many of us have it memorized from 13.2. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers for some have entertained angels unawares. Nothing like a King James version to bring out the beauty of it. Sometimes we think that hospitality is uh, receiving those who've come to our home. And who comes to your home? Well, typically the ones that we show hospitality to are the ones who've been invited guests, right? Your parents come, your aunts and uncles come, your children come back, friends from church come, and they are to receive hospitality, right? Who doesn't receive hospitality? The guy who comes next uh, door to door selling something to you, uh, the LDS missionaries, uh, they're always, they always love me at my house. Um, <laughs> but the word that is used by the writer of Hebrews is a very strange word for the word hospitality. Filio xenia is the Greek word. It's a, it's a compound word, including two other Greek words, philios, for the word love, we get the word Philadelphia, the city of what? Love. Brotherly love, right. Love, philo, familial love, or as he says in our first line, let mutual bro or, or brotherly love continue is one of the ways in which it talks about. The other word is xenia, from which we get famous words like xenophobia. What's that? Fear of the stranger. Filioxenia is the word that we translate poorly into hospitality. The literal translation is to love the stranger. Hi. There's a month of sermons just on that, isn't there? And how difficult that is. We're not just called to be hospitable to those that are that we show hospitality to. We're also to be hospitable or loving toward the strange, that's the actual literal translation, to love the strange, <laughs> or to love the stranger. That's a challenge, isn't it? 
That's a challenge for those of you that actually go into lunchrooms and cafeterias or band rooms or locker rooms uh, on Tuesday morning or Tuesday afternoon. That's a challenge for those of us to go to department meetings or to lunchrooms and cafeterias or water holes uh, in the workplaces in which we work. It's a challenge for all of us, isn't it? We hear the doorbell ring and we think, oh, good Lord, who could that be? Instead of seeing it as an opportunity for, ooh, a little filiozenia, <laughs> a little love of the unexpected and strange. You, you see, folks, we are to be an alternative community. I, I know, and, and you know what's, what I'm glad about the way the church is turning in our culture, meaning being offset from the power base of it, where culture and uh, church and empire are sort of separating now, and the church is sort of on the outs of culture. I think it's great. You know why? Because we can see the difference. Because the church of the last era shared way too many cultural values and the cultural values of our culture began to inform the church as to who we were. And so we began to teach things with no teeth in them, like be nice. Probably an era ago, you would have heard this lesson about entertaining angels unaware with the advice to say, well, just be nice. That has no teeth in it, and it has no good news in it. The good news is this. We're called to be an alternative to the society around you. The church is an alternative to your culture at school. Your church is an alternative to your culture at work. Your church is an alternative to your homeowners association gatherings. And, and it's been a long time since we've looked the same as them, at least I hope. We are together to love one another. In this last week of our challenge from Hebrews, we hear uh, some interesting bullet point shots about what we're to be. Lots of interesting things. Let mutual love continue. We're supposed to be doing that, of course. That's the bottom line. We're supposed to love the stranger. We're supposed to protect marriage. We're supposed to watch out for sexual immorality. That we're, that we're supposed to be different than our culture. You know that stuff that you hear on TV and see on TV? You know, Victoria's non-big secret. Um, and I'm not picking on Victoria's secret. That's fine. Uh, but it's that the culture of we see with the eye and not with the conscience. We're to be different. We're to be unusual. What if, as I said to the little kids today, what if you invited a kid who always seemed to sit alone to your table at lunch? What if you made pains to invite them into your group? What would it be like to reach out to someone who was very, very different than you? What would it be like to give up your seat on the bus who someone, someone came in late and there was none left and they had to do the stand of shame? What would it be like to stop someone from bullying someone else in your workplace or in your school? What would it be like to post on uh, Facebook something kind, something kind, period, uh, something kind about someone who rarely gets noticed? In fact, I invite you to commit to only making positive comments on your Facebook page. That would set you apart in and of itself. What would it be like to invite someone that doesn't get invited to the party to your party? What would it be like to tweet a quotation, maybe even from chapter 13 of Hebrews today, so that others might see it? What would it be like in the applause of shame and instead of standing to applaud that you knelt and provided assistance to the one who now is standing with horror in their hearts about everyone applauding them and their clumsiness. And what would it be like if someone asked you, why are you doing that? And you would to say, because I think it's what God wants me to do. In our series from Hebrews, we've had four lessons. Together we make visible the invisible. Together we turn the outside in. Together we are unshakable. And together we welcome the stranger. Jesus invites not just his first century, but his 21st century hearers to live differently, to break the rules of what have you done for me lately, to have a higher calling than the one of honor and shame in which we still live in our culture, to live with a grander vision of history and humanity. 
to be emboldened with a deeper form of compassion in our world and to value others not for what they can do for you, but simply because, like you, they too have infinite value as God's children. So let's remember Jesus' invitation to the party to be humble, but also when we're on the inviting end, to be mindful of how much God has given you, how richly and abundantly God has blessed you, so that we might live differently as children of the light in the world in which we find ourselves today, of our homes, of our churches, worlds of fashion, worlds of our schools, founded not upon status, but founded upon a much wider base, that of grace and the mercy that flows to us as God's children. Now, things aren't going to change in an instant. As soon as you begin to act some of these values out, you're going to be questioned about why you're doing it. In fact, you might even find yourself on the outside for your filiozenia. Eh, you'll be in some pretty good company then. So St. Paul and all those to whom the book of Hebrews was written, in fact, the saints and martyrs throughout the era, in fact, Jesus himself, we are called to be what the first century church was called was the people of the way. It meant a way, a particular way of life, the way in which Jesus lived, living into God's grace, embracing and living God's kingdom life right now. And it, it takes time. It's not going to be answered tomorrow. And if you invite that kid to lunch on Tuesday, it's not going to uh, transform your culture of your school in a moment, but it might transform that life. And quality and quantitative change begins with one. And that's how society changes. If you've watched again the 50th uh, anniversary of the I Have a Dream speech, you can recognize the truth in that. Martin Luther King was a big believer in changing the soul of the one can quantitatively and qualitatively change the souls of all. So I encourage you folks to take up the mantle and the challenge of our faith and to put this stuff into practice, mercy, loving kindness, compassion, a higher vision for how things can be lived and where God is leading history and our calling to be his compassionate children, children of God, children of light, children of grace. Amen.